Florence Chadwick was a swimmer of yesteryear in uh, about a half a century ago. She was into swimming long distances, let's, let's just say, long distances. She swam in the early 1950s, she swam the English Channel a couple times, setting the, the women's world record at the time. I don't know if it's still standing. But another, another swim that she wanted to do, because she's from California, she wanted to swim from Catalina Island on the California coast to, just off of the California coast, to the California coast, over 20 miles. And she'd done the channel, and she'd done these, these big swims before, so she was not, you know, it's not like it was impossible for her. So she had her boat there that could pull her out if she, if she cramped up or anything, and she started swimming one day. And she swam, and she swam, and she swam, and then the fog rolled in. And the boats, I imagine, were around her, and they were looking out for sharks, and they were trying to communicate uh, and, and communicate with her. And as time went on, the fog got denser and denser, and she just kept swimming and swimming and swimming. And she swam, and after about 15 hours in the water, she said, I just can't go on any longer. And she said, please pull me out. And so they pulled her out. Now, the tragic thing was that she was pulled out about a mile from shore, so close to completing her goal. Afterwards, the media was asking her, you know, what, what happened for it? And uh, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I, could seen, if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. See, her perception of the world and the task in front of her was obscured by the fog, and because the fog was there, because she couldn't see the coast, she decided to give up. Now, <clears throat> we live in a world in which we look around and we, we see, I, I think we see through a fog. We see uh, the media and the news we filter life through that, and I think it's, that obscures the fog of ultimate reality. We think that is ultimate reality. We live in a world where uh, fear and uncertainty are kind of the, the watchwords of the day. And the fog of that obscures what is more deeply and importantly true. We live in a time when there is a fog of personal, individual authenticity and freedom, which is the, the, one of the highest values in our culture today, and anything that comes into conflict with it is rejected. And so we live in this fog, whatever, whatever we feel like, whatever a person feels like, that's what they should do and they should be authentic to themselves. We just, I think we are people living in the fog. And the question for us as Christians is, how do we as Christians press on living in the world filled with the fog? How do we keep from being like Florence Chadwick and saying, you know what, I, I think I'll just give up, only to find out that the shore is a mile away? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because this morning we are going to be in the book of Daniel again, Daniel chapter 7, if you want to turn with me there. We've, we've gone through the first six chapters, and I'll, I'll tell you, a few weeks ago, as I started really studying Daniel chapter 7, I thought, maybe I should move to something easier. Because uh, we just came out of Daniel's, the first six chapters, and those are the stories that everybody knows. We, last week, we talked about the lion's den, and there's the fiery furnace, and there's other stories in there that are very familiar. But Daniel's, Daniel chapter 7 to 12 is different, very, very different. Daniel chapters 7 to 12 are something called apocalyptic literature. The word apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which simply means revelation. Now, when we think apocalyptic, we think of like movies, right, that have the word apocalypse in them. The end of the world is coming. It's all going to be bad. There's going to be like invasion from space or from the, from the sea or some other, these like massive, earth-shaking, terrible things. But the word simply means revelation or revealing. In fact, the book of Revelation starts out with these words in Greek. It says, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And so as we come to Jan- Daniel chapter 7 to 12, we are entering this new type of literature. It's, it's different. It's highly symbolic, as we're going to see this morning. There's images, and there's things, and there's questions surrounding them. Sometimes they're interpreted for us in the text. Other times, we don't know what exactly these things are. But it's fascinating because, because an apocalypse, a revealing, is really what we need to cut through the fog of our day. And that's exactly what we're going to see this morning. So Daniel chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, it's on page 744 in the sanctuary Bibles there. If you don't have one, I'd encourage you to grab one of those. Please take it home with you as a gift from us. I was up this morning, I, was re- I read through the book of Lamentations this morning. I- I'm trying to get through the whole Bible this year. In order to do that, you need to read about five chapters a day. So I read the book of Lamentations, and I would just encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, take that one with you, read it. Pastor Matt has put together a Bible reading plan that's excellent. It's not going through Lamentations, but it has some great, great things. That, that reading plan will take you about two and a half years to get through the whole Bible. So this morning, Daniel chapter 7, we're going to see first the problem, which I've already kind of alluded to a little bit, is going to be brought into to focus by what Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 7. Then we're going to look at the solution. Because for all the ink that's been spilled about the problem, as we're going to see, and all the, the back and forth, like, what, what is this, and what is that, and I don't understand this, and what's going on there, and could this be that person, or that, that kingdom, or that leader? For all of that, that's not the main point of Daniel chapter 7. The main point is in the middle, as we're going to see, and then I want to, I want to think with you, what does that mean for us? So the problem, the solution, the application. Here's the problem, that powerful and threatening powers, they obscure what is truest in the world. Powerful and threatening powers obscure what is truest in the world. We look around, we see all these things going on. We, we talk about, well, China, what is China doing? And what is, what's, what's Russia doing? And what is, what is Amazon doing? And what is Facebook doing? And what is, you, you know, what, what, what is our government doing? We, we look around at the world and we see these powerful forces and we, we feel very small in comparison to them. And powerful and threatening powers, they, they tempt us to just focus on them and make us forget or lose sight of, obscure what is most true that we need to hold on to as followers of Jesus. Powerful and threatening powers obscure what is truest in the world. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, we read, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Now this is fascinating to go back into history, in the first year of Belshazzar, Belshazzar is the guy who, a couple weeks ago, he saw the writing on the wall. That's King Belshazzar. King Nebuchadnezzar died. He was the great king of the Babylonian Empire. He died in 562 B.C. The first year of Belshazzar was 553. There had been some intervening kings. The first year where he was kind of regent over Babylon was 553 B.C. This is what was going on in the world at the time. You have the Babylonian Empire, that's in the green. That's what Belshazzar was kind of ruling over, although there was this pressure on the edges. To the north of them was the Medes, the Median Empire, and this was a large empire. They were were up and coming on the world stage. To the west of them was the Lydian Empire in Turkey, modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor, and they were battling back and forth with the Medes over, over this space. To the east of them were the Elamites, kind of this small kingdom, even To the southeast of the Elamites was this little tiny kingdom called Persia. This is the year 553. And what we see is just this world situation where there's a lot of uncertainty and there's battling back and forth. And if you can imagine being Daniel, he's in the heart of the Babylonian Empire, which is in the decline. In the Median Empire, it is going up in importance and in power. Within about a generation, though, this is what the world would look like, the world of its time. This is one empire. This is the Persian Empire because that little tiny Persian Empire in 553 would would take over the Median Empire in 550, three years after this. And from there, they would destroy the Lydian Empire and then in 539, take the Babylonian Empire, and so it would all be this one empire. All that to say, the, the situation in the world that Daniel is speaking into, there was these 
powerful, potentially threatening feeling forces at play. And it's into that that our text comes. We, we see Daniel, he's, he, he doesn't know about this. In verse 15, if you go there, it says, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. If you go all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 28, he says, Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. He turned white as a sheet. Do you remember in chapter 5, that's exactly what happened to Belshazzar when the writing was on the wall. But I kept the matter in my heart. So he's given a vision of these powerful, threatening things in the world. Verse 2, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. This is where, okay, there's these four winds, there's the great sea, the the winds of heaven. What are these things? We're not exactly sure, but what he's trying to describe is chaos, a situation in which it just feels uncertain and chaotic. Verse 3, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. Now, you have to remember that in the ancient world, the sea was the place of chaos and evil. In many of the ancient creation myths, the force of chaos that was tamed by their, their gods was the, the sea. Even in Genesis chapter 1, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The earth was formless and void. And so in the ancient mind, the sea was not a place where you took a cruise. It was not a place for a vacation. It was, it was a place of danger. It was a place of evil. So out of the sea come these four great beasts. It says they're different from one another. Verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. Verse 5, and behold, another beast, a second one like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6, after this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four beasts of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and exceeding and, and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in broken pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So you have these four beasts coming out of the place of evil and chaos. Now, there's something really interesting here, because if you read about this, there's a lot of people, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but, but there's a lot of people, they, they look at these four beasts, and they look at Daniel chapter 2, and in Daniel chapter 2, there's this statue. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and there's a statue with a head of gold, chest of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet iron mixed with clay. And in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel comes in and he interprets the dream. And you remember what he says. He says to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you are the head of gold. In other words, the Neo-Babylonian empire that Nebuchadnezzar was ruling over was that head of gold. And from there, you could kind of figure out, then after him arose the kingdom called Persia, and that was the the chest, and then the, the belly would have been Greece, and then the legs, the iron legs would have been Rome. But there was a reference point so that you could figure out what each of those symbols was. In Daniel chapter 8, which we're going to look at next week, there's a ram and a goat. But we're told the identity of the ram and the goat. King of Greece, king of Persia, Persian Greek. In Daniel chapter 11, there's another vision revealing... But we're told the identity. There's kings of Persia, we're told about three kings of Persia, and then there's the king of the north and the king of the south. So most people in Daniel chapter 4, they look, they look back to Daniel chapter 2, and they, they line up the beasts with the four kingdoms of Jan- Daniel chapter 2. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Perhaps that's the way we should interpret it. 
But it's interesting to me that nowhere in Daniel chapter 7 is there a reference point. I don't think the purpose of Daniel chapter 7 is for us to figure out, what, was it this kingdom? Was it this kingdom? Was it that kingdom? Which kingdom was it? That's not told to us, though in other parts of Daniel it is. The point is that these, these beasts are real. They're very powerful. Apparently, they're frightening to Daniel. We're actually told um, in verse 17... We're given these little, in verses 15 and following, this is the interpretation, verse 17, it says, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So the four beasts represent four kings, but in verse 23, he says this, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. So the four beasts are four kings who are the heads of four kingdoms, probably the, the first person who would bring the kingdom to prominence. That's the whole reference that we're told. It's four kingdoms four, led by four kings, but we're not told which ones. So you have these four powerful beasts representing these four kingdoms, and then it gets even a little bit more odd. Verse 7 the fourth beast, it was different from all the other beasts, from the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So you have the four beasts, and now, now we have these ten horns. See, this is highly symbolic language. It's meant to convey something important for us to understand, but it doesn't necessarily fill in all the question marks that we have. Ten horns. Verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. You have these four beasts, we're told are four kingdoms, four kings. Now you have these ten horns coming out of the fourth beast. And then you have this one horn coming up and uprooting three others and replacing them. And it has eyes and a mouth and it's speaking. Human qualities. Now horns in the scriptures are... Uh, a symbol for power, for a ruler, for authority. So we kind of know that, so there's a little bit like, okay, what is that? Well, we're told later on. Daniel says, I wanted to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest in verse 19, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron, claws of bronze, and which devoured and broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. So he wants to know from this heavenly being, he's been transported in this vision. In verse 15, it says, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. And I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. So there was someone standing around, be it an angel or, or someone like that, who's giving Daniel the interpretation of this dream. And now he's talking about the horn and this one little horn that came up. It seemed greater than its companions. Verse 24, it's a king. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. So the horns represent kings. And another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former once, and she'll put down three kings. So the horns represent kings, and this, this last one, he's going to put down three kings, and he's going to rise to prominence. Okay. Do we know anything else about this horn? Verse 21. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. This horn is a powerful king. He replaces three kings. He's not like... Not like the others. And apparently he doesn't like the people of God. He makes war with the saints and prevailed over them. Now some people would tie this to the Antichrist that we read about in Revelation. There's probably good reason for that. But he makes war with the saints. Verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came 
and judgment was given. Verse 25, we see he speaks words. He's going to make war with the saints. He's going to speak words against the Most High. He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given to his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. Most people think that that is a three and a half year period. So you have this horn that's going to come up. He's going to make war against the saints. It says he's going to prevail over them, the saints being the people of God. He's going to wear them out. They shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So this is half of the vision. And this is the part that's scary. And we think about that. We think of the the line, he's going to make war against the saints. He's going to prevail against them. He's going to wear them out. Well, that sounds an awful lot like that could be against you and me. Like there's powerful and threatening powers out there that when we focus on them, it obscures like a fog what is more true. That's the problem. Powerful and threatening powers, they, they were real in Daniel's time. They're real today. I was talking with some guys from uh, Options Pregnancy Center and uh, in the last, I don't, I don't know how long they've known about this, but in the last year, they've come to realize that with the current administration in, in our state of Minnesota, they had been getting some grants for the last like 15 years, just year after year, they've been renewed. But this year, the grant's going away. And we look at that, and we look at the situation. And we think there's powerful and threatening rulers out there, and our hearts start to get afraid. And if, if we get too far down that road, we may think, well, I, maybe I'm just going to bail. Maybe I'm just going to get out of the ocean. I'm going to get in the boat. I'm just going to be safe, and I'm going to give up. But that's why Daniel chapter 7 is given to us, because this vision that we've just seen, this earthly vision, what we can see with our eyes that Daniel has just related to us, these powerful rulers That's not the whole story. That's just the first half. The point of Daniel 7 is right in the middle, verses 9 through 14. And it's this, is that God triumphs over powerful and threatening powers through this son of man. God triumphs over powerful and threatening powers through the son of man. That's the actual point here that I don't want us to miss. God's going to triumph over powerful, threatening powers through the Son of Man. Verse 9, as I looked, this is after the description of the beast, as I looked, thrones were placed. Thrones were where the king would sit often in judgment. Thrones were placed in the ancient of days. Interestingly, this is the only place in the scripture in Daniel chapter 7, the only place that God is called the ancient of days. Three times. And the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne, listen to the imagery, was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning, and a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Three times. The the throne's on fire, the wheels are on fire, and coming from the throne is fire. What's fire? Fire is an image of judgment. It represents judgment. It says, a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. So we have the picture of the beast coming out of the earth and just trampling on everybody. But then it's like there's a split screen, and on the top of the screen, there's another picture. And there's a throne. And there's the ancient one, God himself, sitting on the throne. And the fire imagery is about judgment. And the ten thousands and the thousands are about all the angels and all the the people who serve him. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, now now it's as if Daniel's eyes go from heaven, from that heavenly judgment scene back to earth. He hears something. As I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. 
As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So you see this picture. God is judging. And what's going on on earth? The fourth beast, the powerful beast, it's trampled down, destroyed, its body's burned. It's been judged. And then verse 13. And I love this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven. Now, the clouds of heaven are symbolic. Only God rides on the clouds of heaven. This is a symbol of deity coming. In fact, in Exodus, it says, as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation, the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. When God gave the law at Mount Sinai, a cloud settled on the top of the mountain. When the Father spoke an anointing over the Son, it was out of the clouds. In the Scripture, the clouds are symbolic. When someone comes with the clouds of heaven, it's symbolic of God himself. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So there's this, this being who comes and he's presented before the Ancient of Days. That means he's worthy to come into his presence. You and I could not go into the presence of God apart from the blood of Christ. And yet this, this person, he's worthy to come and be presented before the Ancient of Days. Daniel says he's like a son of man. Look at that, like a son of man. He looks like a human. In verse 14, and to him, the one coming on the clouds like the son of man, presented before the ancient of days, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Listen to the words, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So you have the earthly vision of powerful, threatening beasts and horns doing whatever it seems they want to do, but the heavenly vision is different. God is judging. God is on the throne one like a son of man comes in, is presented before him, and he is going to be given all rule and authority and dominion. And his kingdom is going to go on and on and on and not be destroyed like these other earthly kingdoms. It says, God will triumph over powerful and threatening rulers through the Son of Man. He's God's agent of triumph. So what, is this, what does this mean for us? I think it means that we need to, we need to, instead of looking at what we can see, the stuff that was freaking Daniel out, the stuff that obscures what is most true about the world, we need to remember, we need to visualize that higher level, the Son of Man, that is going to be given all rule and power and authority. And the moment that we think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the water and I'm going to quit, don't quit. Remember, the Son of Man is going to be given all rule and power and authority. And that's, that's really good news because who is this? Who is the Son of Man? Daniel didn't understand this. We understand this as Christians. We look back and, and we see this. Daryl Box says in his commentary on Luke, Son of Man, interestingly, is Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. He says things like this, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man himself has nowhere to lay his head. He says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say, stand up and walk to the paralytic. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Over and over and over in the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself. He takes Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 language, and he applies it to himself. And after he was arrested, 
he was taken before the high priests in the Sanhedrin, and they wanted, they wanted his blood, and they wanted to, to, uh, to kill him. So they had all these people bringing charges against him, but none of the charges stuck. So the high priest stepped into his face. This is in Mark chapter 14. Jesus remained silent and made no answer. They're just yelling at him, screaming. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, look at the language, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And notice the response of the high priest. The high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death because the priests understood what Daniel chapter 7 was saying, that the one coming on the cloud, seated at the right hand of man, of, of God, was God. was a divine figure. And when Jesus employed that language, he was claiming to be God, claiming to be the Son of Man. And so what happened after this? You know what happened? They made war on Jesus. In our, in our chapter, verse 21, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. So after Mark chapter 14, what did they do? They made war against Jesus. They, they whipped him. They stripped him. They spit on him. They nailed him to a cross. And he died. But then he rose again from the grave. And for 40 days, he appeared to his disciples. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And I wonder... I can't prove this, but I wonder if the vision that Daniel was given of the Son of Man coming into the presence of God was the moment when Jesus ascended into heaven, having completed his work, having won the victory over sin and death for us, and he was ushered in to the throne room of God and seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So, for us, what does this mean for us? A couple things. Why did Jesus do that? Why did the Son of Man do this? So that he could pay for our sins. So that we could be forgiven. So that he could make a people fit for living in his kingdom forever and ever. So one of the applications of this is not to lose heart, but to become holy, to allow him to transform our hearts and our lives so that when, when he establishes that kingdom forever and ever, we will be fit citizens of that kingdom. We will have learned through discipline and through sanctification and through submitting to the Spirit what it means to be a citizen of that kingdom. That's one thing. Another is when, when we look at the world, you, you open up whatever news source you have, like an actual newspaper or however you get your stuff, and you start, to, you start to go here where I go. Oh, man, it's bad. And it looks like the beasts are raging. And it looks like they're trampling. It looks like the, horn, the horns are maybe like making war against the saints of God. We need to lift our eyes and visualize the Son of Man and know that He's ruling and will rule and will, will bring this whole thing to his, his purpose and His end. Maybe, maybe this week you need to just sit down with this and just think about it. Maybe you need to memorize Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, this is our Lord Jesus, was presented before him, verse 14, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom 
one that shall not be destroyed. Friends, that is the ultimate truth. And we need to keep in mind, we need to keep it in the hearts, we need to have in the, the mind's eye of, of, of our heart when it feels like the fog of the world is rolling in on us. So that we don't get out of the water, so that we don't quit swimming, so that we persevere. Florence Chadwick, about two months after she failed to swim from Catalina Island to California, she tried again. Probably the same boat, probably the same people, same distance, over 20 miles. She got halfway through, and guess what happened? The fog rolled in. And she kept swimming. And she kept swimming. And she swam all the way to the coast. And afterward, they said, they, they asked her, how did you do it this time? And she said, when the fog rolled in and I couldn't see it, I visualized the coast. And friends, visualize the Son of Man. He's on the throne. He's ruling and reigning. And I, I can't think of a, a, a better way to end the sermon than by singing with you. And so the band's not going to come up. You're going to be stuck with me on this microphone. I apologize. <laughs> if you want to stand up, though, you can, you can stand up. We're going we're gonna to sing three verses of a song that talks about the Son of Man. It's, this is an old hymn. It's called Holy, Holy, Holy. Would you sing with me? Hopefully the words are up there. So I'm going to need them. All right, here we go. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early Father, we thank you that through our Lord Jesus Christ, you've promised that you are going to triumph over all the kingdoms of this world, or to all the powerful things that can frighten our hearts, make us want to give up. We just thank you, and I pray for, for each one of us this week, wherever we go, or that we would truly visualize and know that Jesus is at the right hand that he is ruling and reigning, that he loves us, that we're in his hands, and that his kingdom 
is going to go on and on forever and ever. Amen.